And come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Soaring I shall be in spirit till released from flesh and sin. Yet from what I do inherit, hear thy praises, I'll begin. Here I raise my Ebenezer, here by thy great help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. such a great verse and Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God but what he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood and how his kindness yet pursues me mortal tongue can Clothed in flesh till death shall loose me, I cannot proclaim it well. And oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. And let thy goodness, just like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. But here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. What a great day, and all oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face, full of radiant blood washed linen. How I'll sing thy sovereign grace. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Take my ransom. Come, my Lord, and come, my Lord, no longer tarry. That's right. So send thy angels now to carry me to realms of endless day. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. And what more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. 
Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Do I have to sit here? You may be seated for a minute, maybe. <laughs> I'm going to do our scripture reading, and my Bible's a different version than what our things are, so that's why I'm carrying this and reading from this. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to be, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right, would you stand and let's sing one last song before Susan comes and speaks. <laughs> Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word and take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness that the light of christ my 
might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, then fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. And teach us, Lord, full obedience and holy reverence, true humility, and test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity cause our faith to rise cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority words of power that can never fail let their truth prevail over unbelief <clears throat> and speak oh lord and renew Oh, help us grasp the heights of your plans for us and truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity and by grace will on your promises and by faith will walk as you walk with us speak O lord till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come, to sit at your feet, to learn, to sing praises to you, fellowship with other ladies. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time, bless this day as we come, that we would receive the food of your holy word, Lord, and that you would speak to us in the way in which only you can, that you would transform our lives and that ultimately, Lord, um, your church, your kingdom would be built and, ulti and ultimately, Lord, that you would receive all the honor and all the glory. Be with Susan now. She speaks. Give us ears to hear we might um, be transformed and made more like Christ in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, ladies. Hope you all rested well. And if you didn't, my philosophy is there's always tonight. So anyway, it's good to be here back this morning, and I wanted to share just uh, about the little books on the table, and the next session I'll share about the, the larger books, the Bible studies, but I have written other books uh, as a biblical counselor and just a discipler of women, just things that I think would be helpful tools, and so I just wanted to share a little bit of those real quickly before we come into our second session. Uh, this one is, What Does a Spirit-Filled Marriage Look Like? And uh, you might say, well, I don't know. Mine isn't spirit-filled. Well... <laughs> 
you uh, should be. My husband used to say in premarital counseling, he would tell couples uh, two things that'll make your marriage work. Make sure you're walking in the spirit. And number two, don't micromanage each other and you'll have a great marriage. So, uh, but I'd go a little more detail and list the 13 things that need to be in your place or be in place in your marriage, things like humility, love, forgiveness, and then the details of what does that look like when you practically live out where the husband is loving his wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for her and where the wife is submitting and respecting her husband. A call to scripture memory is my journey through scripture memorization. Uh, when I met my husband, he had most of the New Testament memorized. And the man who discipled him had the entire Bible memorized. And so when I met him at the age of 18, he encouraged me. Uh, he asked me if I'd memorized scripture. And I said, yes, I'm a Baptist minister's daughter. I've memorized John 3:16 in the Romans road. And uh, <laughs> he said, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a book of the Bible. I didn't know at that time he'd memorized most of the New Testament. So he shared with me his method. And I memorized the epistle to the Colossians and hopes he'd asked me to marry him. And it worked. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's my journey. Who should memorize when, where, how, and I give helpful tips on how to memorize scripture. Speaking the truth in love in a post-truth world is my journey through, uh, I guess, really disappointments through the years of women that refuse to do the right thing. They're bitter, they're angry, uh, they're holding grudges. They avoid people that are challenging to them, even their own husbands. And uh, so what is speaking the truth in love? Why don't we do it? When do we do it? Where do we do it? How do we do it? And I give some helpful tips on how to speak the truth in love, especially in difficult situations, maybe a husband, maybe a wayward child. I also failed to mention that at the, in the back of the spirit-filled marriage one, I have some special tips too on respecting your husband because I do think that's uh, very challenging for many women. They don't respect their husband. And so uh, I give some helpful tips on, on areas that I really see as failures among women. I know my husband, I think he wanted my respect more than he wanted my submission. And so I think it's very important, just like we want them to love us and care for us and protect us, they want us to respect that, that position. And so I take a little time for that. Um, helping women put off life dominating sins. Uh, these are the seven top sins women commit and then seven biblical motivations for putting off sin and then just seven practical tips. How do I practically die to myself and put off the sin? And so I just give some practical things there. Somebody was asking me about uh, mentioning last night about my two mentors and that I've had for almost 40 years now. And so this is my journey through that, a call to discipleship. What is biblical discipleship? It's not getting together for a cup of coffee and just talking about the weather and the upcoming election. Are you going to vote for Biden or Trump or anything like that? It's a, you know, well, I'm not going to get into politics right now. But anyway, tempting, but no, no, I don't think I'll do that. But what is discipleship? What is biblical discipleship? Who should disciple? Where do we do it? How do we do it? And I give a lot of practical tips for biblical discipleship. And by the way, most all these things are also, uh, you can download them audio from my website or YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel where you can get most all my Bible studies and most all these teachings. So if you prefer to watch, uh, that's a, a one way to do it as well. Uh, 20 tests for God's little children. Uh, this is what I wrote in lieu of my concern through the years as I have discipled many women throughout the years and uh, just have met a lot of women who struggle whether they really know the Lord or not. Uh, they don't know for sure they have eternal life and they're, they're kind of wallowing around in, in concern and anxiety about that. And you know, John wrote 1 John. That was the whole reason he wrote 1 John to the church at Ephesus. He says, these things I write unto you that you might know for sure you have eternal life. You don't have to be in doubt about it. And so he gives 20 tests how you can know for sure you have eternal life. And so this is how we know we know him if we keep his commandments. This is how we know we know him if we love the brethren. So I take those 20 tests and uh, exegete them a little bit and give some practical things just to examine yourself. Make sure that, ladies, that's the most important thing, right? In this life is where you're going to spend eternity. When you slip into uh, this, uh, out of this life into the next, where are you going to go? And I know uh, my husband was alone when he passed away due to the COVID restrictions and that was hard for me as a wife not to be able to be with him those 10 days he was in the hospital. And uh, that was very challenging, actually. And um, when, 
a couple weeks had passed after we had buried him, a, lady, a man in my church said, you know, I'm really glad Doug was alone when he passed. And I said, why are you glad for that? <laughs> I wasn't. And he said, well, remember his uh, sermon in 1 John? He said, he said in one of his sermons, when it comes time for me to die, I want to be alone because I want to make sure I'm ready to step into eternity. So, ladies, we want to make sure when it comes time for us to die, right, we're ready to step into eternity. That's the most important thing. So uh, that's, a, that's a good little tool. If you're, if you're working with someone that doesn't know for sure about their salvation, that would be a good little tool. Speaking of salvation, I wrote this in lieu of a, it's called uh, The Liberating Gospel. And I wrote this in lieu of an outreach to Mormons, uh, Muslims, Jehovah Witnesses, and some Christian women were in that outreach. And so I had one opportunity to speak and in the evening at a church in Arkansas, I think it was. So uh, that was the one, church, one uh, speaking engagement I actually turned down because they said, we want, me to, you want you to talk about Jesus, but you can't talk about the Bible. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you talk about Jesus without talking about the Bible? Don't know how to do that. So I turned it down, and then they called me back, and they said, no, our pastor really wants you to do it. And I go, well, I'm going to be using the Bible. So uh, anyway, if you're going to have one opportunity with a bunch of women that are in cults, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to talk the gospel. So I, I narrowed it down to four points. They all start with the letter L. So if you have trouble sharing your faith, this is maybe a good tool for you to remember how to share your faith. We had a lady recently that bought 200 of those, and I said, why do you want 200 of those? She said, well, when I die, I want everyone at my funeral to have one when, when they leave. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. So she was concerned that they knew the gospel. So, all right, enough of that. We have come to our second session. We started last night grounded in, and we saw last night we wanted to make sure we're grounded in Christ by making sure we're abiding in him. We saw there's two kinds of branches that are in him, some that are bearing fruit, uh, that, that the Lord prunes more so they'll bear more fruit. And we saw that there are some that are not bearing fruit. And so the Lord uh, lifts them up and he sees and inspects why they're not bearing fruit. But then we saw there was a, a third type and that was someone that was not in him. And we saw that at the end of the age, they're going to be gathered together and burned in the fire. The whole point of the message was to abide in him, stay in him, remain in him. And so that really kind of leads into what we're going to talk about right now. Because one of the things I mentioned last night was the way that we abide in him is by remaining in him through prayer uh, and the word of God. And so in this session, this is going to be more of a, a practical session. It's not going to be exegetical or expository, which is really how I like to teach. But uh, I've been concerned through the years. A lot of women uh, have asked me to help them to be disciplined in the word and prayer. They just don't know how to do that. And so in this session, we're going to be talking about being grounded in the word by being disciplined in the word and prayer. And so you have an acrostic there, uh, the acrostic disciplined. And so we want to make sure, ladies, that we definitely are being grounded. This is a day in which we cannot afford not to be in God's word. I, I fear, um, as the psalmist says, it talks about, you know, will you be able to stand in the day of adversity? And if you can read uh, the signs of the times and you can read what's going on, ladies, we need to be strong. Uh, we do not know what's coming. And uh, I know I've gotten in my car several times and uh, just getting my car going and getting ready to leave to go somewhere and all of a sudden comes up on my car and says, hello, this is artificial intelligence and we would like to manage your uh, text messages and converse for you. Would you like this? Uh, uh, would you like us to do this? And I want to say something not nice, but I say, uh, uh, no. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, things are getting weird. And, you know, Google knows, uh, they say Google now knows your thoughts. That's kind of creepy, too. So, uh, you know, we don't know what's coming down the pike. I know when my dad was alive, he used to believe the beast in Revelation was a, some type of computer that knew everything about us. And it's kind of heading that way. So uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Persecution. Uh, is coming. It's here already. If you're going to stand for what's right, if you're going to stand against the transgender movement and all the crazy stuff out there, people wanting to be cats. I saw a guy the other day in Tulsa that had, he reformed his ears to look like a cat and he had whiskers. And I was like, this is really strange. But if you're going to stand against that, you're going to be persecuted. And so ladies, uh, the way you're going to be able to stand is to be, uh, make sure that you're a woman of the word, you know the word, and you are a woman of prayer. So with that in mind, uh, let's pray and we'll begin this session together. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for the time that we have this morning to be in your word. Lord, thank you for these precious ladies that have come, some from uh, 
uh, distances. Thank you for um, the, the, the ages, young, old, middle-aged. Lord, thank you for them. Thank you for uh, the churches that are represented. Thank you for this church that has put on this conference. Father, thank you for the food we enjoyed, the fellowship we enjoyed this morning. Uh, thank you for the husbands that are at home taking care of children uh, so that their wives can be here and maybe other family members, Lord, too, are doing that. Thank you. So, Lord, bless in this time and use it for your glory. I would pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned last night, I gave you a slice of my testimony. And when the Lord saved me around the age of 30... Uh, he put an insatiable desire in my heart for the Word of God. Now, I read my Bible every day because that's what pastor's wives do, but I didn't have a hunger or a desire for the Word of God. And looking back, I know now uh, that that's a promise of the new covenant, uh, according to Ezekiel, where he says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit within you. I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you you and cause you to walk in my ways. So I know that's happened to all of you. Uh, that was the one thing I noticed after salvation. What used to be a duty became a delight. And so all the things that I used to do out of duty and legalism, I started doing now because I had a desire. And even though I had that desire, I had a hunger for the word of God, I did not know how uh, to pursue or to go about learning the Bible. Uh, my, my husband had taught me how to memorize scripture. And so even though I had memorized the epistle of Colossians when I was 18, I never memorized anything else after that. And so at the age of 30, I started uh, again memorizing books of the Bible, which is still one of my greatest joys and one of the best Bible study methods I know. In fact, I often feel like Jeremiah, your words were found and I ate them and they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Why? Because I'm called by your name, O oh God. And so if you've never taken up that habit, I would encourage you to do it. It'll change your life. As Peter says, taste and see the Lord is good. It's just like a chocolate chip cookie coming out of the oven hot with a glass of milk. You know, it's good, isn't it? It's hard to stop, but you can't eat just one. And uh, so that's the way it is about the word of God. Once you start tasting of the word of God, whether it's through scripture memorization or other methods, your word is found and you you want more. You have an appetite for more. And even though I know that all of us in this room who have been called by God were daughters of the King, there are many of you, I'm sure, because I meet many women around the U.S. and around the world that struggle with daily discipline. Daily discipline being in the Word, Scripture memorization, prayer, and things like that. And the most common excuse I've heard through the years is this, I don't have time. Susan, I don't have time which usually is translated, I won't take time, because ladies, we all have time, right? We find time to do what we want to do. And if you take a, a journal of what you do throughout the day and maybe uh, start writing down what you do throughout the day, I imagine some of you will find, as many women that I've tried to help find out, they're spending a lot of time doing this, scrolling, you know, two to three hours on Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, or whatever it is, or recipes. Uh, you know, we scroll and, and we try to find the best recipes to make this dynamic meal and it's gobbled up in 10 minutes. And we go, what was the point of that? I spent all that time doing that. Are you kidding me? And uh, so we, we all have time, right? But we want to make sure that we're using it for eternal purposes. And ladies, instead of having meaningful time in the Word, we're often doing unnecessary things. And then we wonder, why aren't we growing? Why don't I have victory over my sin? Where's that abundant joy that I've been promised? Where's the peace I've been promised? And more often, ladies, the fault lies with us. Now, having said that, I do know that there's many of you that really would like to know how to be disciplined in the word and prayer. So what I wanna do, and it's in the acrostic discipline, I wanna give you 10 important keys of how to have a meaningful time in the word and prayer. The first thing that you must do in order for you to be disciplined in the word and prayer is you have to have a desire, a desire for the word and a delight in the word. A desire for the word and a delight in the word. Ladies, if you don't have a desire to be in the word, you will not be disciplined. You will not be disciplined. If there's no hunger there, no desire, uh, you're not going to want to do it. I remember when our daughter was growing up, she's 43 now, but she was growing up and, and we had her take piano lessons and she was amazing. I mean, she could just sit and play the piano just almost naturally. And after about a year or two, she goes, mom, I really don't like this. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why she gave it up. 
and because uh, I, I like to play the piano. But anyway, I said, well, honey, you're so natural. She goes, Mom, I don't like it. So I, I, we didn't make her do it anymore. And to my knowledge, my daughter, who was 13 at that time taking piano lessons, has not sat down at a piano in 40 years. Why? She has no desire. She has no desire to play the piano. My friend, if you do not have a desire to know the Word of God or talk to God in prayer, that's going to be a huge hindrance to any discipline. And so you need to ask yourself, why don't you have a desire? I remember talking to a gal one time I was discipling, and I was asking her uh, how her time in the Word was. Yes, she was faithful. I said, do you enjoy it? She goes, no. I go, you don't? She goes, no, I don't enjoy it. I don't have any appetite. So if you have no appetite for the Word of God, I would first of all challenge you to make sure you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's a promise of the new covenant. He changes our desires. Examine yourself. Make sure you're born again. You might also want to see if you're holding on to some life-dominating sin that you're not actively trying to fight. You might have a guilty conscience of sin that's not being confessed. Uh, as Peter, just says, uh, Peter says, we're to lay aside all, all of malice, envy, evil speaking, all these things, so that then we can desire uh, the pure milk of the word like that newborn baby. So sometimes sin keeps us, as Howard Hendricks says, sin will either keep you from this book or this book will keep you from sin. And so that's the way it is, right? So if you're, if you're hugging all your sins, you're not going to have an appetite for Scripture. And so that might be another reason as well. Ladies, make sure you're not nibbling from the things of this world or you will have a minimal appetite for the Word of God. In fact, uh, this morning we had some great breakfast, right? But uh, if I uh, decided on the way here to stop and maybe get two or three cinnamon rolls and gobble those down uh, before I got here, I probably would not have any appetite for that fruit and all those other nutritional things at breakfast, right? So if you ruin your appetite for dinner by a big fat piece of cake, you're not going to want to eat dinner. Well, if you're nibbling at things of the world, you're not going to have an appetite for the word. You're not going to have an appetite. Many are tasting of other things, therefore God is their, not their delight, but he is their dread. Secondly, if you desire to be disciplined, the I on your acrostic there, idols must be put away. Idols must be put away. You know, it's interesting when God gave Ezekiel the promise of the new covenant, part of his promise was this. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. You might say, well, Susan, I don't have any idols. I don't have a Buddha in my house. I don't, I don't have idols. Well, you know, an idol is just simply something that you love more than God. An idol is something that you think about all the time, spend money on, energy on, time on. Something that you're more loyal to than you are the Lord. And ladies, we all have propensity to idolatry. And a good exercise to do is keep a record for one week of where your time goes, where your money goes, where your energy goes. Because ladies, that can be a revealer of idolatry. Uh, many of us have idols, our own body. I was uh, at a church last weekend and I stayed over to hear the pastor preach before we headed back to Tulsa from Arizona. And he was saying the new thing now, uh, the new generation, is the body. Uh, we worship our body. That can be an idol. So we spend all this time exercising it and trimming it up. And ladies, it's going to be dust. As Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what good is it if you have a healthy body but a perishing soul? What good is that, right? And so the body has become an idol. That's an idol. Uh, women, their, their looks, their, their weight, their makeup, their, all these things can become idolatrous. Exercise, food, sleep. Uh, and so there's many things that can creep into our life. And all of a sudden, we're worshiping that more when then we're worshiping God. And ladies, we worship something. You worship something or someone every day. And it may be yourself. Uh, we are very, living in a very narcissistic society where it's all about me. It's not about you. In fact, there was a conference at my hometown, and the marquee on the, on the, you know, the advertising, it says, this woman's conference, the title is, it's all about me. And I'm like, really? Well, I ain't going to that one for sure. It's not about me. It's about him, right? And so, ladies, idols can take away your devotion to God, that time to be disciplined in the word and prayer. The third thing you must do if you desire to have a disciplined time in the word and prayer is this. Spend ample time. Spend ample time. Ladies, you cannot be stingy in your time with God. You must be generous. Let me ask you, has God been generous with you? You're alive today. You're breathing. You can see. You can hear. 
But you know what? The most generous thing he has done is crush his son, bruise his son, allow his son's blood to be poured out for you and for me. I mean, that's generous. That is lavish. He lavished his love on us. We are stingy with him, but he's not stingy with us. Ladies, you cannot be stingy with your time with God. Serious prayer takes time. In-depth Bible study takes time. When I was growing up in a Baptist minister's home, we used to sing a hymn, uh, Take Time to Be Holy. (laughs) But we don't want to take time to be holy, right? We want instant holiness. Well, guess what? It doesn't come instant, like instant mashed potatoes and instant Internet. You know, we get so frustrated when our Internet's not working. We want it right now. Or I know some of you have an instant pot. I still don't have one of those, but... I'm curious about them, but uh, it's just me now, so I rarely cook anymore. But, ladies, nothing is instant in the life of a believer. A disciplined, godly life is not for the faint-hearted. And so if you're going to spend ample time with him, it might mean you need to get up early. Get up a few hours earlier before the kids do. It might mean you need to stay up late. It might mean that you, uh, you know, take some time in the afternoon and have the kids, if you homeschool or something like that, that they go in their rooms and do something by themselves so that you can do that. Do you know Susanna Wesley who, who had 19 children? Susanna Wesley had 19 children. She took two hours every day to be alone with God. Two hours every day with 19 children. And what she would do, she would take her apron and put it over her head. And so all the children knew this is mama's time with God. Don't you bother mama right now. And uh, so she, they said that she would study, she would plumb the depths of scripture and pray. And you know, out of her came Charles and uh, John Wesley, Charles and John Wesley. And they said Susanna had a profound understanding of the Bible. But, ladies, she was willing to take those two hours every day. In fact, it became known as the tent of meeting, and uh, not even the littlest one. The big ones would take care of the little ones. But two hours every day. Ladies, it takes discipline to do that. The fourth thing that will help you in being disciplined is to see the C, cultivate daily habits. Cultivate daily habits. Ladies, we all have habits, right? Daily habits. Did you brush your teeth today? Don't come near me if you didn't know. I'm just kidding. There's some mints out there for you. (gasps) I brushed my teeth this morning, right? So that's a habit I do every day. I brush my teeth every morning. Most mornings I take a walk. I didn't do that today, but most mornings I have the discipline of taking a walk. Some of you have a discipline of reading the news. Uh, Every morning you put on your makeup, you put your contacts in. We have all these disciplines that we do every day, but what about cultivating a daily habit of being disciplined in the word and prayer? Bible study, memorizing scripture. Uh, Usually when I go out on my walk, that's when I memorize. I try to memorize a verse a day I don't always get to, but you know, when you walk 20, 30 minutes, I used to walk an hour, but I don't have time anymore, so I just get 20, 30 minutes in, but that's a great time to memorize a verse. So you can do these, some of these things, listen to the Bible while you're exercising. There's a lot of ways you can take Bible intake while you're doing other things. And ladies, again, it might mean doing what Jesus did. It said he got up a great while before day and went into a solitary place and there he prayed. Or it might mean staying up all night or or staying up part of the night uh, before uh, you go to bed after everyone has gone to bed. It might be saying no to something you really want to do. Maybe that's what we have to do. Ladies, we would not think going a day without cleaning our teeth, or at least I hope you wouldn't. So why would you think about going a day without cleaning your soul through the word of God? Why would you think about that? Jesus said in John 15, 3, you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. We talked about that last night in the parable of the vine and the branches. Now, a helpful hint when we consider this principle of cultivating daily habits, as I mentioned, many times you can be praying, memorizing the word while you're exercising, putting on your makeup, showering, driving, 
uh, the, that's a, the driving time is a lot. Debbie and I, sometimes we drive long, long ways to get to some of these conferences. And uh, next week, I think we have a six hour drive. Sometimes we have nine, 10 hour drive. We listen to sermons. Sometimes we listen to podcasts. We listen, to, that's a good time to take in uh, spiritual food. And so there's a lot of things that you can be doing even around the house. I mean, when I used to, when my husband was alive and I would iron his clothes, uh, that was a good time for me to memorize scripture. And so when I would be ironing his shirts, I'd have my verses there, or cooking his dinner or cooking our dinner. I'd have my verses there and be working on my scripture memorization. So there's a lot of ways that you can discipline yourself just when you're doing every daily duties around the house. Uh, you can be taking in the word of God. You can be praying, right? Now, next on our list of essentials is this, I. The I here, it's important to understand proper hermeneutics. Important to understand proper hermeneutics. Ladies, if you want to do Bible study correctly, you have to do it understanding proper hermeneutics. Now, don't let that word scare you. It's not a scary word. Hermeneutics just means method of interpretation. Ladies, there are 4,000 cults today, 4,000 cults and religions. That, is ter that should be terrifying to you. And do you know most cults, they're formed by one verse ripped out of its context to prove something that God never meant to say. And so we as women especially, uh, because the Bible says we're the weaker vessel, uh, those are the ones the false teachers prey on. If you look at false teachers and you look in the audience, it's mainly women. And the Bible says in Timothy that these false teachers, they creep into your house and they lead captive, silly women led away with various lusts. They lead them away with their false teaching. And now we don't actually have them coming into our house, but we have them coming into our house through podcasts, television, social media. And so ladies, we cannot afford not to know how to study the Bible correctly. And I don't have time. I wish I had time. That could be a whole session in itself. But what I mean by proper rules of interpretation we need to understand, as you, as you study the Bible, when I'm studying the Bible, I take a text, like that text I had last night, John 16, 1 to 6, I put that in a Microsoft document, and I bombard it with questions. I do the inductive Bible study method. Who, what, when, where, how, why? And I bombard it with as many questions as I can, because the more you observe, the more accurate your interpretation will be, and your application as well. So let me just, let me just give you an example, a verse all of you know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That was one of the verses I told my husband I knew when I was 18. John 3, 16, right? So, uh, so let's say you're going you're gonna to study it, right? You're just going to study John 3, 16. So you ask questions like this. Who is God? Who is his son? What does begotten mean? What does the world mean? What is everlasting life? When did God give his son? How does a person believe in him? Why would a holy God love a sinful world? Now, ladies, you could bombard that, that one verse with 100 questions. And then you go and you try to find the answers. And you don't find them in the favorite commentary. You find them in the Bible. Guess what? The Bible is a great commentary on the Bible, right? And so I, I use commentaries last. But uh, that is the best. Let me say this. The more questions you ask, the more you observe, the more accurate your interpretation will be. The less you observe, the more likely you will be in error. Ladies, Bible study takes time. Next, I endeavor to find answers from the text itself or the Word of God. After that, I consider the Greek or Hebrew, which is imperative in Bible study, because ladies, words change. Uh, like we would say salvation. Oh, yeah, that means to be saved from my sin. No, salvation in the Bible has two different meanings. It could be salvific in the sense of your salvation, or it could mean just be delivered, be delivered from a trial, a calamity. But so that's why we have to go back to the original language. And ladies, you don't have to buy a bunch of books. There's a lot of websites now for free where you can get the Greek and Hebrew to understand the original meaning. Uh, for example, when I was growing up, uh, gay meant happy. You know, well, gay doesn't mean happy anymore. It means, you know, you're unhappy. Uh, but it means, you know, you're a homosexual or a lesbian. And by the way, gays are not happy. But, um, but so words change in meaning. But we've got to get back to the original language. What did it originally mean? So it's imperative we know what the original uh, author is saying to the audience. I turn to commentaries last because those are men a men at best. They're not, it's not God's word, but they, they are helpful in giving historical background and things like that. But I know for me, I'm overjoyed many times when I do the hard discipline of study and I come to a conclusion and then I do read my favorite commentary and I'm like, ah, 
I came to the same answer he did. What do you know? We have the same Holy Spirit. Imagine that. Who leads us into all truth. But ladies, there's nothing like discovering it for yourself. And so I want to give you two, uh, because I don't have time to teach a whole uh, thing on this. I'd love to, but on how to study the Bible correctly. But um, there's two things that I would recommend. Number one, there's a little booklet called The Joy of Discovery by a woman, Olita Wald. O-L-E-T-A-W-A-L-D. You can get it on Amazon. It's tiny, about twice the size of my little booklets here. But she gives you how to study the Bible correctly. And then secondly, there's a great, you can get it now for free on YouTube. Uh, This is how I learned how to do inductive Bible study. Howard Hendricks, who now is with the Lord, living by the book. There's 19 videos. They're about 20 minutes long max. Very, I'm going through it right now with the lady in my church who wants to learn how to study the Bible. It's changing her life. So he goes through this very same thing, how to observe, how to interpret correctly, how to apply. So Howard Hendricks, Living by the Book, get him free on YouTube, about 19 videos, about 20 minutes long. Now, if you're studying a whole chapter, not just a verse, you could ask questions like this. What's the principal subject of this chapter? What's the main point of this chapter? Who are the persons in this chapter? What does this teach me about Christ? Is there an example for me to follow, an error for me to avoid, a command for me to obey, a promise to claim, a prayer for me to echo? And so, ladies, these are, as I said, you know, I don't have time to get into what I'd like to be getting into, but just give you a taste for that. But, ladies, the Bible's clear. We've got to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And today we have many people that are wrongly dividing the word of truth and they're leading men and women down the road to hell. I mean, I live one mile from Michael Todd's church, which a lot of you probably know, Transformation Church. That guy's a wackadoodle. And uh, on Easter, one Easter, he had drag queens on the stage and and uh, they were showing their booties and they, he crucified a woman on the cross. And it was, it's just vile what's going on in my hometown. I come from Tulsa, which is the word, where the Word of Faith movement started. And so these men and women are wrongly divided. They're, they're blasphemous. They're dishonoring our Lord. And so, ladies, we need to be women of the word. We need to know how to study and how to interpret correctly. Now, next, something that's imperative but often neglected is the P. Pray. Pray before, during, and after your study time. Pray before, during, and after your study time. And, of course, ladies, we need to be praying all the time. Pray without ceasing. I know since my husband passed away, I pray more now than I ever have uh, because I don't have somebody to ask questions and get wisdom from, so... The God of all wisdom, he's, uh, he's great. <laughs> but ladies, we need to pray. Pray. Do you ever sit down and get ready to read your Bible or study and say, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your law. Open my eyes. I want to see. Uh, and so ladies, pray before you start. Pray during your study time. Sometimes I'll say, I don't understand this text, Lord. Help me. I, you know, there seems to be a couple of the interpretations here, would you guide me into all truth? That's a promise of the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you into all truth. And then when you get done, thank God. Thank you, Lord, for the time I've been with you. Thank you for what you've taught me. Another thing that I found very helpful in my daily Bible reading, uh, which I do, I try to read systematically Genesis through Revelation, read through my Bible probably about six times a year. But just doing that, one of the things that I try to do is write out prayers based on what I've read. That helps me to stay focused. Uh, I'm going through the Bible this year with a gal I mentor, and we're writing down all the promises of God. And so one time we read through the Bible, writing down uh, different things things like all the women in the Bible. After my husband passed away, I I told her, I said, you know, I'm really wanting to focus and kind of write my own theology on heaven and hell because my husband is in eternity now. Could we read our Bible through this year looking for all the instances of heaven and hell and just kind of see what what is eternity? Even though I'd read my Bible many times, I kind of wanted to do my own thing. So this will help you keep focused in Bible study, Bible reading, uh, write out a prayer, write down something that you are looking for. Ladies, it'll reinforce what you are learning. Now, speaking of prayer, ladies, it's imperative that you spend time in prayer every day. Uh, I hope you have a a set aside time to pray, but you should just talk to God like you talk to your friend. Talk to God like you talk to your husband, only don't be nasty in your tone of voice. So 
<laughs> maybe don't talk to God like you talk to your husband, but, you know, just talk to him throughout the day. Um, I have found many things helpful in my own personal prayer time. I like to use scripture when I pray for people. I use Paul's uh, prayers. I use Psalm 119. It's wonderful, 176 verses. Every one of those verses has to do usually with scripture, and so you can't go wrong in praying that. I also use uh, the Valley of Vision, which is a book of Puritan prayers. And so I, I reason I like that is because they have a high view of God, low view of man, and their prayers are very Christ-centered. And so this morning, in fact, where I was praying for certain people, uh, I was using a prayer out of the Valley of Vision, praying certain things for different people. And so it just keeps my thoughts heavenwards. Um, and so, ladies, we want to make sure that we are uh, not becoming earthly in our prayers. And I have certain people I pray for every day. I, I divide my prayer journal into seven days. And uh, I have seven grandchildren, so each one of them gets prayed for each day. I used to have, I was one of seven children, but two of my siblings have, have passed. And uh, so I have five siblings. I pray for them. I used to pray for my husband every day, but he's not here. So now I pray for my pastor every day, my new pastor. Um, I pray for people in my church. I pray, I have it all divided up. I pray for the women I mentor. I, there's various things I pray for. I pray for um, the leaders we're supposed to pray. I know it's hard to pray for Joe Biden, but I do. And I pray for his salvation. That's the only thing I know to pray for. Uh, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem because we're commanded in scripture to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And boy, we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, right? In fact, I was supposed to go to Israel in two weeks for a tour and not going now because uh, of what's going on. So uh, we need, ladies, it's endless. But I do, I do like keeping a prayer journal. I like uh, being focused. Another good thing that I have enjoyed a lot for my personal time with the Lord is music. I grew up singing. I, I love to sing. I love music. So uh, that helps me to keep my, my thoughts heavenward. So uh, a lot of times I'll play uh, music because it's a wonderful form of prayer and worship, especially after my husband passed away. I found I was listening uh, to music a lot, and it's, it's the window of our soul. To me, music, uh, especially, I mean, I'm talking about Christian music, obviously, uh, it, it, it says things that I have a hard time expressing. And so music is another great way of having meaningful time uh, with the Lord in prayer. Uh, a helpful hint. I'm just giving you a helpful hint. This was said many times by Elizabeth Elliot. And as a young woman, I used to go to her conferences as much as I could. But she often would say that in her personal time with the Lord, uh, and I find it to be true in mine as well, uh, you often get distracted. And so she had a good uh, idea of keeping a piece of paper uh, next to her desk where she was studying or praying. And when she got distracted, she'd write down, you know, because you're thinking, oh, I, that's right, I got to go to the grocery store. Oh, yeah, and I need to call so-and-so. And oh, yeah. And uh, so she would write down whatever she was, was causing her to be distracted, and then she'd go back to what she's doing. And now we have the cell phones. And I have a friend that uh, she puts hers in another room because, you know, we get those little alerts and distractions. And so that might be something you need to do. Uh, just go put your phone in another room, turn it off. I sometimes will turn mine upside down, turn the volume off so that I'm not distracted by that. So, uh, ladies, there's just there's a lot of things I could say about this, but these are hopefully just some helpful tips uh, in this area of making sure that we're doing the right thing. The next on your list is the L. The L, let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. Let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. Ladies, depend on him. Don't run to other sources so quickly. Wait on the Lord. Sit still. Take time to meditate. Think through things. You know, when I listen to a preacher, I can tell whether they've really thought through the text or not, or whether they're just cutting and pasting. You can tell if someone's thought through the text. Ladies, take time. Think through what is being said. Take time to be holy. Let the, let the Holy Spirit guide you into all truth. And I think this is a huge problem among Christians. I really do. Uh, we have forgotten the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I know the Word of Faith, the New Apostolic Reformation, they've taken it to an extreme. But because of the extreme, ladies, we've forgotten. There is a Holy Spirit. He's part of the Trinity. He lives within you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So don't forget him. We have the Father, the, Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so uh, let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. Let him be your guide. He's our counselor. He's our comforter. He's our instructor. He's our convictor of sin. We often run to Google, a friend, a spouse, a commentary, a website, 
our favorite preacher before we run to the Lord, before we run to the Holy Spirit. Ladies, he's a, he was aided you in your salvation. Did you know that? You're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. He's a part of your sanctification. We're changed from glory to glory, even as what? By the Holy Spirit. He's the one that helps you in sanctification. Um, next on our list is the I. I, increase in your knowledge. Increase in your knowledge. If you want to be disciplined in the word and prayer, ladies, you've got to increase in your knowledge. You should know more about God and his word today than last year. Your prayer life should be richer and fuller this year than last year. And ladies, if it's not, you need to ask yourself why. If you don't know more about God today and his precious word, then you need to ask why. Why? You should be growing, right? If your prayer life isn't richer, if your prayer life is not more heavenly, if it's setting more here on things of this earth, you need to stop and ask yourself, why? Ladies, you need to be increasing in your knowledge. Don't be content with status quo. Don't be content with status quo. Don't be apathetic. We need to be zealous for the Lord. We need to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know women who will spend hours listening to and reading religious garbage, but re refuse to spend that same amount of time with the authoritative, holy, sufficient, inspired word of God. They refuse, but they will spend time doing other things. Well, an attitude I pray none of you have is the N on the acrostic, the N. An attitude I pray you don't have, never think you've arrived. Never think you've arrived. Ladies, this is a killer in Bible study. Oh, I know that. I don't need to study that. I don't need to go to that ladies' conference. I've heard that before. Oh, my pastor's preaching on that book of the Bible. I've heard that before. That'll be a killer in Bible study. It'll be a killer in prayer. Oh, I've been praying about this for years. Why should I keep praying about it? I know my husband prayed for his lost father for years, and he finally gave up, and he, was just, he told his sister, he said, I'm done praying for Dad. Dad's never going to get saved. She goes, well, I'm not stop praying for him. And uh, a year before he died, he came to the Lord. And my husband felt convicted, like he should have kept praying, right? Ladies, once you think you have nothing to learn, you will fail. If you think your spiritual life has reached its potential, you're in danger. Pride goes before destruction and destruction before a fall. If you ever think you're above your peers in knowledge and spiritual maturity, beware. Beware. Paul says, what makes you different from anyone else? And what do you have that you did not receive? Ladies, God can take that away. I'm very aware. I am very aware that God, if he wants to at any time, when I ever become puffed up, prideful, he can take away anything he wants. Take away my life. He can take away my spiritual gifts. Ladies, pride is a killer. In fact, the Bible says those that compare themselves among themselves are not wise, right? So if you think you're more spiritual than the lady sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, you might want to stop and rethink that, right? My husband used to say the two twin pillars of the church are humility, which we find little of today, and love, right? Humility and love. Included in this principle, never thinking you've arrived, would also be the caution uh, not only for pride, but ladies, admit when you're wrong. Admit when you're wrong. Uh, I've been studying and teaching the Bible now for over 40 years. Some of my views have changed. And I've dug a little deeper. I've thought a little more. I've memorized more scripture in its context. And I've had to go back and say, you know, I think I'm wrong on this. I think I'm, my husband did that too. And I'm so thankful that he wasn't stuck in that, that the more he studied, the more he thought through things, biblically and theologically. Admit when you've been wrong. You know, I was raised in a different kind of a home than uh, where I am now, and so I was brought up in more of a, a legalistic type situation. And I know after we got married, my husband used to say, Susan, you need to educate your conscience through scripture. Educate your conscience through scripture. And so that has helped me through the years, because ladies, Jesus is not looking for outward manifestations of legalism. He's looking for an inward transformation of your heart, right? Which will cause you to walk in his ways. Admit when you've been wrong. Be willing to change your view if it lines up with scripture. Remember, my dear sister, it's not about being right. It's about rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we need to be doing. Well, the last important principle is this. Endeavor to use what you're learning. Endeavor to use what you're learning. Paul tells Timothy, therefore, thou, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the thing that you've learned from me, be faithful to pass on to other people. 
Uh, Titus says that young old women are to teach young women. So ladies, the things that you're learning in Bible study, you should be passing on. Doesn't mean you have to formally teach a Bible study, but pass on to your friend, pass on to your children, uh, get in a discipling relationship, be able to share, get in a good ladies Bible study, uh, pass it on to your children, your grandchildren. Uh, when you're in your prayer life, uh, pass on to people. Hey, guess what? I was praying about this this morning. You know what God did? He answered my prayer. This is how I'm growing in my prayer life. Endeavor to use what you're learning in your Bible study and in your prayer time. Ladies, knowledge without a changed life is just knowledge. Knowledge without a changed life is just knowledge. In fact, even in your prayer life, what is God teaching you in prayer? Are you sharing that with other people? Do you let people know when God answers your prayers? I always think it's so hard, uh, so, uh, I guess, disappointing when you're in a prayer meeting or you're with a group of people and they'll say, hey, is there any praises? And everybody's mouth is mute. And I'm like, you should just praise God. You were able to get out of bed this morning, right? But our lips don't sound forth the praise of God. Why? Why? Uh, God should be, ladies, if God is not answering your prayers on a daily basis, you might want to, first of all, see if you're praying. But secondly, ask why. Why isn't God answering your prayers? I can honestly say that I, I write out my prayers. I write out a lot of my prayers every day. And I write a lot of things I'm thankful for. That was one thing that mentor told me that's lost two husbands. She goes, you got to stop thinking about what you lost, Susan. Start thinking about what you have. So I do. I write down every day. I'm a, I'm a good disciple. I'm a good student. So I write down things I'm thankful for every single day. And ladies, I can honestly say God answers prayer every single day. But we don't have because we don't ask, right? James says you don't have because you don't ask. And uh, so we need to be praying. If you're praying more and yet God is not answering any of your prayers, then something's wrong. Something is wrong. So how can we discipline ourselves in the word and prayer? Delight in the word and desire the word. Do you have an appetite for the word of God? If not, why not? What is taking away your appetite? Is your time in the word and in prayer a delight or a dread? Do you pant for God like the deer pants for the water brook? Can't wait to meet him. Again, if not, why not? Are you certain you have a living relationship with the living God? Secondly, idols must be put away. What do you love or whom do you love? Do you love that thing or that person more than God? What do you spend your day doing? Have you kept a time journal lately to see where your time goes, your energy, your money? Remember, my friend, God will have no other idols before him. He is jealous when it comes to his time with you. Next, spend ample time. How much time do you spend in the word and prayer on a daily basis? Are you under the myth that a chapter a day will keep the devil away or a popcorn call to God will keep you from becoming a fraud? Are you willing to miss sleep or even a meal to have more time with God? What are you willing to give up for God? What is crowding your schedule that keeps you from having meaningful time with the Lord? Next, cultivate daily habits. What daily habits do you have in place right now? Brushing your teeth, putting your makeup on, exercising, eating, working, driving the kids to school, homeschooling your children. Have you cultivated a meaningful daily discipline of time with God? Are you willing to put your apron over your head for two hours to be with your Lord? Next, it's important to understand proper hermeneutics. Do you know the proper rules of interpretation? Do you involve yourself in serious Bible study or are you sloppy in Bible study? What are you currently studying? What are you currently memorizing? Next, pray before, during, and after your study time. And of course, ladies, we need to be praying daily. Are you in the habit of praying when you read, study, or memorize? Do you realize you cannot learn anything apart from the help of the Lord and the dear Holy Spirit? How has your prayer life enriched this past year? Are you praying more or are you praying less? Are you praying more spiritual requests or more temporal requests? Is talking to God a delight to you or a dread? Next, let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. Do you rush to other sources first to get help in answering your biblical questions? Or do you pray and ask the dear Holy Spirit to help you as you study and read the word of God? Next, increase in your knowledge. Do you know more about God this year than last year? How has it changed the way you live? Has your prayer life matured this past year? Does God answer your prayers on a daily basis? Next, never think you've arrived. 
Do you secretly think you're more mature than others when it comes to Bible knowledge and prayer? Do you come to the Word with humility and a desire to know more? Is there room for improvement when it comes to your time of prayer? And last, endeavor to use what you're learning. Endeavor to use what you're learning. Who have you passed biblical truths on to this week? Are you involved in a lady's Bible study or a discipling relationship where you can pass on the things that God is teaching you? Do you eagerly share with others how God is answering prayer in your life? Ladies, we would do well to be reminded of a couple of things before we close. Paul tells Timothy, reject profane and old wives' fables, but rather exercise yourself into godliness. Why? Because bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for this life and the life to come. The women in the biblical world would no different than us. They would get caught up in these wives' fables, these silly old stories. They'd get together, not to talk about the Bible, but just talk about foolishness. And we have a way of doing that today, don't we? Talking about foolish things. Ladies, women can get caught up in all type of womanly things. But there's sometimes not much profit in that. We're to discipline ourselves to godliness it's profitable for this life and the life of eternity. And so, ladies, I would challenge you. Discipline yourself to godliness. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. But, ladies, be a daughter of Christ whose delight and drive in life is a pursuit of a meaningful and fruitful relationship with God. It's written... Seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Will you? I pray that you will. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time together. And, oh, Father, I pray that you will take my feeble attempts to try to portray to these ladies that they cannot afford, cannot afford not to be lazy and sloppy in Bible study and prayer. Oh, Father. I pray that you would uh, encourage their hearts. I pray that you would prick their hearts, Father, to realize that they need to put away some of these crazy things that women do and be serious about time in the Word and prayer. So, Lord, I pray that it would not be a drudgery to them. I pray that it would be a delight to them. I pray that they would taste and see that the Lord is good, that being with you in prayer and through the Word and throughout our day, Lord, is just a, it's a delight. It's a delight. It's not a dread. So, Father, help us to put away anything that is hindering that meaningful relationship with you through your word and through prayer. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.